everybody, and welcome to Solid Ground Church's online campus. I can't believe I get to be with you again, whether you're watching live or later in the week. I love reading your comments. So if you would just uh, take a moment just to type out where you're watching from, I'd love to know how you're doing. If you need prayer for anything, you can reach out to us and one of our prayer partners will pray with you. And my goodness, uh, if, if you're new here, um, it's it's nice to meet you. My name's Mike, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'd love it if you would take time to fill out our Connect card. It helps us to get to know each other better. We won't sell your information or anything weird like that. So if you do us a, a, a favor and fill that out, that would be amazing. So. Uh, Pastor Marie and the team are ready to lead us in some worship songs. So let's take a moment just to shake off everything that we've brought in here from the week and get ready to, to hear some encouraging words and to experience some time together in the presence of Jesus. So would you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we breathe in and, rem and are reminded that you are sustaining us. And no matter what we're going through, uh, we know that you are bigger than it and that you offer us help. So will you remind us of that this morning or this, this afternoon, <laughs> whenever we're watching this, that, that you are here with us? And would you please fill us with your hope and your love in this moment? In the mighty and strong and healing name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me my battles I 
Pastor Murray and the team will be back with us in just a moment, but I gotta tell you, I am so excited that it's almost Christmas. Okay, it's not almost Christmas, but we are preparing for our Women's Advent Retreat on November 13th, and it is going to be something that you do not want to miss. We're so excited, we haven't been able to have one since pre-COVID, so you please make sure to sign up as soon as you possibly can. We have a limited availability of, of seats and, and spots, and we don't want you to miss out. Also, it is not too late to join one of our groups. We have life groups that are meeting if you're in the Rancho Cucamonga area um, that you can still sign up for. And we also have a Sunday school class and we also have a women's Bible study on Thursday mornings that has started up again. So things are moving and we're gaining inertia and we would love for you to be a part of it. And another way you can be a part of the Solid Ground Church family is, is to invest here. Uh, if you're just checking things out today, please feel no pressure or obligation to give. But if you consider Solid Ground Church your church home, would you please consider investing into the mission of our church as we reach and share God's love with the city of Rancho Cucamonga and now far, far beyond. And the quickest and easiest way to do that is to give online. Uh, that's the way my wife Marie and I uh, give, uh, but you can also send your checks to the church office. And it's just a way of responding to God's grace and what God has done for us. And uh, another way we can be a part of what God is doing in this world. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity and for the ways that you have brought us to this moment. Uh, we give you our hearts and we give you our time and, and rededicate our lives to you in this moment. So we're trusting that you are going to speak and be the loudest voice right now in this moment in our heads and in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh not here for blessings. Jesus. 
Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your prayer. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'm caught up in your presence. Oh, I I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessing. Jesus. 
Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. If you can't say something nice about somebody, just scream it. Now, we all know, we've all heard that before. If you can't say something nice about somebody, then don't say anything at all. It's such wonderful advice, isn't it? And it sounds really good on paper. And when it comes to our normal, everyday life, do we really do it? I think most of us are, are pretty good at that, uh, for the most part. But our culture, it tells a completely different story. Uh, as I was reviewing our passage that we're going to be focusing on today, I kept thinking about in my, in my early 20s and the advice I got about entering into the entertainment industry. I really wanted to be an actor or a camera person or anything having to do with film or television or theater. And in my, yeah, it was my major for my first couple years of college. And I would watch interviews with movie stars or producers or directors. And I picked up on a common thread. Uh, now this is in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. The common thread was that when someone would say, what's it like to work with? And they would mention a celebrity. And no matter who it was, nine times out of 10, they would say, oh, that person is wonderful to work with. Almost verbatim. Oh, that person is a joy to work with. Oh my goodness, that person is wonderful. And then I would go out into my, uh, my dorm or go to class because I was in college and I was at a Christian college and I would hear my peers and I would hear the words coming out of my own mouth too when we would talk about other preachers or someone from another denomination or the chapel speaker that came in that day and say, oh, that person is just blah, 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 blah. And I can't believe they said that. Or that person annoys me. And I can't believe they wore that. And I was thinking, I had this realization, like a 20 year old, 21 year old, like, oh my goodness. Like there's people in Hollywood like the, the big bad Hollywood, and they are publicly talking about each other. I don't know what they did in private, but the words that were coming out of their mouths about their peers were overwhelmingly more positive than the way my own Christian brothers and sisters talked about other Christian brothers and sisters. And I was, I was convicted but also thinking like, oh my goodness, and the whole world is watching us. If, if they're listening to our sermons, or there was no social media back then, but if people are listening to the words that are coming out of our mouths, um, what kind of an example is that to the world? And, um, and, and, and what kind of example is that to the people in my own life that are not Jesus followers? Uh, and James has some really good wisdom for us, and, and we've made it almost halfway through the, the fourth chapter of James as we uh, continue our way through this book written to people in transition. And this one, this one uh, has some good, good things for us to ponder that are still relevant in 2021 uh, today. So uh, if you could navigate in your Bibles to James chapter four, we'll start in verse 11. And if you've got a paper Bible, giving you a second to, to get there, or, or if you're following along on the YouVersion Bible app and our notes are in there, um, let's, let's go ahead with verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. Those are some harsh words. Uh, and he's talking about the law here of, uh, of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, uh, the, the Leviticus, um, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, when you slander one another, and the, the, the English translation slander in the original, it's like to speak evil. And James is using this 
this word very broadly, saying, you know what, when we slander each other, what we say, it may be true, but it can be unkind. We can be right in the wrong way. Yeah, it may be questioning authority. It may be canceling out our brother or sister's good work by just backbiting and politics and unhealthy water cooler talk. And it's very threatening. That kind of thing is very threatening to the unity of the church. And the tense he's using is in, uh, this, this word slander. It tells us that, that the people were actually in the habit of criticizing one another. James isn't just saying, oh, hey, watch out. If this comes up, it's a temptation. It's a slippery slope. Watch out. Like He's confronting an already ingrained habit among the church, uh, brothers and sisters there. And here James is saying, no, watch out. We need to take the responsibility because they're, uh, the, the responsibility for correcting one another or, or sharpening one another. We take that very seriously, but we don't do it the way the culture does. We don't let it devolve into personal attacks. We don't let it devolve into, into the toxic and dysfunctional kind of speech. Because already in the first three chapters, James has warned us, like the power of the tongue is something we don't mess around with. Like we have to be careful because the devil wants control of that thing and it can set a fire, it can start, uh, it can start a cancer that goes throughout church, throughout a community. So be very, very careful. Yes, brothers and sisters, I think James would say to us today, like we do have a responsibility to speak the truth, but let's make sure we're doing it in the right way. And don't get into the habit of, of criticizing one another. He continues in uh, verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So we've, we've talked about this law and this lawgiver. Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. There's a, in the Ten Commandments, it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor in Exodus 20, 16. And Jesus actually put this, this love your neighbor as yourself on his top two list. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength as the first most important commandment. But after that, it's, it's love your neighbor as yourself according to Jesus. So if a believer speaks against another believer, uh, that person is disobeying this law because that person is not showing love and treating others as they want to be treated. And when you say with your actions that, that you're above this law, because I think most people would say, uh, even people who aren't Christians would say, oh, loving your neighbor is yourself. That makes sense. It's good business. It, like on paper, treat others how you want to be treated. Absolutely. But how many people, uh, it would be excusable, I would think, in my mind, to if you haven't said yes to Jesus, to say, well, that works on paper, but that doesn't work in the cubicles or in the boardroom, or that doesn't work when I'm trying to cut a good deal it doesn't work in politics. That's, it's, it's a nice standard, but it's okay if I step away from that. And if you and I are honest, even as believers, sometimes that thinking can creep into our mind. Like, yes, it's, it's a commandment. Yes, Jesus says it's the, most, the, the second most important commandment, but every now and then we can just kind of like put it to the side and say, okay, that's good for everybody else, but for me in this situation, I'm just going to give it to somebody or, or talk behind somebody's back. Like when you, and James is saying, when you say that by your actions, that you are above the law, you're actually saying that you yourself are above God. That's, that's heavy. That's weighty. Because a rational person would never say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge God. I'm going to judge God's laws. Like, that's a really big deal. And in the, in the culture that you and I flashing forward to today and this time, like, we're, we're 
inundated in a culture of slander. If you watch the media, and I don't keep up with Hollywood as much as I used to, but I'm sure celebrities are getting into public fights. I, I hear that every now and then a lot more than they used to. Like we're surrounded by a culture of slander. And during the, the lockdown, the beginnings of the lockdown, when things were heating up, when it came to COVID, when it came to the election cycle and, um, and race relations, and uh, things aren't perfect by any means, but right when things, I, when I was noticing, things are really heating up and noticing this culture of slander and left versus right, Christian versus non-Christian, all kinds of ways people were putting their identity in the wrong place and discourse in general, um, was re I was noticing it was really getting on the, the super freeway towards being toxic and slanderous. I got this great, great advice from my pastor, Bishop Perry Engel. I have a pastor. Uh, and I was like, how do we engage with our brothers and sisters and, and discerning how, what is right for this church? How do we engage with the world? And he gave me these, these principles um, to, to just kind of filter the words that are coming out of my mouth. And he talked about leading with principles like doing our best to direct discussions on focusing on principles and policies rather than on people and personalities and avoiding partisanship. Like avoid turning like healthy discussions into politically partisan debates and choosing to engage with the conversation's underlying principles and values because the truth is important we need to discuss it we need to have robust discussions especially with our brothers and sisters in christ but to keep the main thing the main thing and to to respect every person and when we when we feel like the the little warning sign maybe a yellow light or a warning flag in our heart when we're starting to insult starting to label people, stereotype people, name calling anyone with whom you disagree. Like uh, back to high school, when someone's mom comes into the conversation, it's already devolved and you need to take a time out and regroup. Like instead, we need to respect every person uh, as an image bearer of God. And of course, non, especially people outside of the faith, we need to be uh, very cognizant that this is a person that needs to experience God's love. And then for our brothers and sisters in Christ, when we're having a robust conversation or, or tempted to talk about them and they're not in the room, like they deserve the honor that's just right there uh, and attached to being created in God's image. And for us to be consistent and strive to, to, to consistently be principled when encountering all the, the, the complex moral issues that we face and be uh, guided by the scripture and our understanding of, of what Jesus actually taught and to, to be a peacemaker, like to regard ourselves as a reconciler, an ambassador. We represent the living God and how we talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Like the world is watching, whether it's online or, or we're, we're in, a, in a conversation just face to face. Our identity as Jesus followers, followers are it's tied up in being a reconciler, an ambassador, and peacemaker. And um, uh, also being quick to listen. We've read that in the book of James. Being quick to listen and slow to speak. Seeking to listen first. These principles have been so helpful to me. Uh, to always, uh, again, back to Jesus' commandment, love our neighbor as ourself, to have the marginalized on our mind. Uh, Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you have done it for me. And then a, a good healthy dose of self-awareness. And before you speak, as we're hopefully being quick to listen, we're also mindful of our own shortcomings before we attempt to point out the faults in other people. And that allows us to be become known as a person of humility, a person of character, a person of integrity, while we avoid uh, the all too common accusations of, of being hypocrites. Uh, it's often leveled at Christ followers. And uh, 
the last piece of advice I got when it comes to engaging this toxic culture was to follow Jesus before anything else and above everything else. Seek to know, love, and follow Jesus through the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a lot of contentious issues and, and co- those issues and those conversations are going to come. And when they do, ask, ask yourself, it's not cliche, what would Jesus say? Ask yourself, how would Jesus love this person with whom I disagree? I don't usually get to the application point in this, but it's so relevant and so helpful to give us handles to take this, this stern words from James to his original uh, recipients and apply it to today. Because James is, is confronting individuals who might be tempted to, to set them up themselves up as like personal watchdogs over other believers. I view it like, uh, like being a, a, some sort of religious referee. Uh, and you could watch the news or, or people, especially in churches, like, oh, that's wrong. Yeah, like, a, like in a football, they throw the flag, or in soccer, they throw a red card. Red card! Some of us have like a red card spirit that we have to fight. <laughs> you're wrong! You're wrong! Red card! You're out of here! Like, we can't minimize. When we start uh, throwing red cards, we can't minimize the danger of what can happen when our criticism goes off the rails and it turns into gossip and it turns into slandering. That doesn't do you any good and it doesn't do the body of Christ any good uh, when it comes to us being healthy and it certainly hurts our witness and our example out in the the greater culture because people, like I've said before, people are watching. So after these These words of of being, watch your mouth, again, reinforcing that point. He transitions to this different thought, but it's still connecting. It's still connected to the warning about how dangerous it is to put ourselves in the place of God. When we take on the role of being uh, the spiritual referee, that's saying, okay, we're, we're stepping into God's place. God needs a little help straightening out the world. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. There's other ways we can do it too. In verse 13, he says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Doesn't that just make you feel warm and fuzzy to think about yourself like a mist (laughs) that just vanishes? But what a good reminder. We get these grand plans about what we're going to do. And, uh, and we can treat God like, okay, we've, we've believed all the right things and we go to church on Sundays, we go to life group and like we've checked all the boxes, we believe all the things, but Monday to Saturday, okay. It's up to me. And I don't think many people think that consciously, but that's an that's a easy rhythm to slide into. And here, in, in those verses, James isn't confronting uh, having a good job, being good at your job, having a plan, making a profit. Those things aren't bad in and of them, not at all. What James is confronting here is making plans without God, living like practical atheists, like confessing one thing with our mouth and then living a completely different way, which is one of the themes here in James. And if we're not careful, we can think that we really are self-reliant. If we're not careful, we can really think that we are independent. And those are, those are not bad things in and of themselves, but if the, we get to reality, we are not, we're dependent on God. And we're not, and we don't want to be independent from God. Like we need, we're depending on God to make our brains function so that we can breathe without thinking about every single breath. Like we can't even breathe independent from God. He puts the breath in our lungs. And what a good reminder that God actually cares about the little stuff. It could be tempting. It could be really tempting to say, oh, I don't want to bother God with this. This is just a little thing. But God loves to be a part of every single decision that we make, every single step that we take. 
I'm reminded right now of the psalm. It says God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That God wants to be involved in every single step. It's a lamp unto where your feet are and a light unto the path just a little bit ahead of us. Not like a lamp unto the whole road and the whole journey. God wants us to be dependent on him every single step. And that's that we're not bugging God. And James here is saying like, hey, watch out. When you say you're going to do this, it's almost like it's pretty close. Actually, it is. It's boasting, which is another massive theme in this letter. When you boast about your independence and what you are going to do and how much money you are going to make, watch out for those pronouns because there's a lot of you in there. And, and instead, he's saying, no, he, he would say like, don't leave God out of your plans. Like when it comes to your career, uh, is it merely enough to, is it merely just a way for you to get enough money to buy what you want? Is money for you a, a symbol of your independence? Um, like I said before, do you say God isn't interested in the little little stuff? So I'll, I'll take this part. I'll, I'll catch you later, God. Do we make practical decisions, education, job changes, moving, investments, and, uh, and spending? Do we do that without prayer? Like God wants to be involved in that. And the fact is, God has the first claim on our life. God is the creator of all of this. And with that being said, James continues and says, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. That reminds me of God's response to the rich man in the parable that Jesus told in Luke 12, uh, verse 20. God says, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. Like, we don't have the promise of tomorrow. Uh, so how much better and how much, actually, how much anxiety would this take off of us if we realize we don't even have to make the little decisions alone and we're in constant conversation with God? God, help. God, give me the wisdom, please, uh, to make this decision. God, what do you think about this? God, uh, I need you. That, that, so actually, it's expanding. We don't just like rely on God Sunday. We get help seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, John Wesley, one of the great leaders of the church, said it like this. Realizing the future is uncertain not only teaches us to trust in God, it helps us to properly value the present. To be obsessed with future plans may work our failure to appreciate present blessings or our evasion of present duties. John Wesley would agree with James as saying like, it's more than just saying, if God wills it, and then going off and, and executing our plan and now, it's, it's not just something that comes out of our mouth. Like, it's about evaluating our life and our decisions and the words that are coming out of our mouth by God's standards and about evaluating those things by God's standards and God's goals. How wise is it to listen for God's advice? We have access to all the wisdom of God who knows everything, by the way, and we have access to it and there's, there's nothing off limits. Nothing off limits. I, I wanna take advantage of that. This excites me that I don't have to figure all of this out alone, whether it comes to, to politics or whether it comes to, to a, a decision on how to spend money. We can listen to God's advice and we have access to God's advice. So here in James 4.17, he's coming in for a landing on, on this thought, and he says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin for them. What a great summary of the first four chapters that we've read. Sin isn't just knowing that, ooh, that's naughty, I shouldn't do that, and going and doing it. That's a sin. But also, if we know that we are, are to do something, we are to apologize. We're to bring peace to a situation. We're supposed to show up and, and help somebody. We have the means to help somebody or the skill to help somebody. Like, and we don't do it, then that's a sin for us. James wants us to be free of living a 
double life of believing one thing and acting another way. That leads to double-mindedness, it leads to a, a character split, and it, frankly, it takes a lot of energies. It takes a lot of energy. So just to sum up what it meant uh, for these folks when it comes to slander, or when it comes to boasting and, and trying to live independently from God, uh, I think James would sum it up like this, the end doesn't always justify the means. Like, oh yeah, I slandered a little bit. I, I gossiped a little bit, but um, uh, it, it worked. Uh, I, I, I did a little back channel uh, slander of this person and, and they got moved in their department. That's just how business works. The end doesn't justify the means. We think about the, the Pharisees and, and how they used actual scripture to, to to elevate themselves over other people. They, used, they tried to use scripture to cheat, uh, to cheat and to, to trip Jesus up. They, and they wanted, they actually wanted so many of the right things. They wanted God's kingdom to come. They wanted the Messiah to come. They wanted the right things, but they went about it in the wrong way. And that can happen to you and I if we're not careful. This is a, 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 a sobering thought. To, to filter every word and every decision through what Jesus would say. And this is also uh, when it comes to, because I'm sure there were real conflicts in this church, in these, in these churches that James was writing to. But James reminds us to strive for biblical open mindedness, not just open mindedness, but biblical open mindedness, especially in the non essentials. You think about. Uh, Paul, one of the first leaders of the church, he was actually persecuting the, the, the followers of Jesus Christ based on his understanding of the scriptures. Then he met Jesus face to face on the road to Damascus and had a massive heart change and realized he was trying to do the right thing but doing it in the wrong way. He was not actually advancing God's kingdom but Satan was using Paul to persecute, to persecute the children of God. Peter had this uh, biblical open-mindedness open as well. He had this vision from God about the covenant and, and how, how non-Jewish people could come to Jesus and be adopted into God's family. And because he was curious, because he was open to God speaking, God was able to use Peter in mighty, mighty ways. And maybe when we encounter a difficult conversation or one of these tricky situations, it's whether it's in our churches, with our families, or out in, out in the greater culture, if we get curious and say, what, what, what are you saying about this, God? As we, as we search through the teachings of Jesus, as we search through the, the, the whole of Scripture, for, for principles that can speak to this and to, to search for ways that God is speaking uh, to the, the folks back then in ways that actually speak to us right now. Maybe we won't make the same mistake as the Pharisees. Maybe we can actually be a voice of truth, a voice of beauty, a voice of goodness, of everything that's pure and true and right, and we won't miss it. And just the reminder, to keep our integrity intact by realizing that we're not God. It's funny, as I look through these scriptures, there's so many reminders, whether it's taking the Sabbath and keeping it holy, or, or just this reminder to, to continually depend on God for all of our decisions. It's a reminder that we're not God. You are not God. Have you been trying to do it alone? Have you been trying to figure out your problems by yourself? They're bigger than you. Maybe it's a hurtful habit. Maybe it's an unhealthy thought problem that you have. Maybe it's a, a situation in your life that, that is bringing you so much anxiety or hurt or pain or trauma. And you are right when you say it's bigger than you. But the good news is you do not have to figure it out alone. In the first chapter of James, he says, if you lack wisdom, ask and God will freely give it to you. Let's not put our trust in worldly things. Let's not put our trust in the way the world works and then, and then boast. Like sometimes if we're doing it that way, the worst thing that could happen is for our plans to turn out right and think, look at what we did. 
No. Like, the way of Jesus is inside out. It's upside down. It's, it's not the way the world works. And I've noticed over the past couple of weeks, I've said that uh, if you're watching this and, and you're just checking out church or checking out the Jesus thing, you're not on the hook for any of this. But I want to make it clear that there's a wide open door and an invitation just for you to live this life, to try it out, to live this upside down countercultural way and say, maybe I've been doing things the way that, that everyone around me is, but there's a different way for me to do this when it comes to the words that come out of my mouth of trying to fix problems or fix disagreements. I've been doing it the, the slanderous way and, and getting involved in personal attacks or, or just trying to do things on my own. The invitation for all of us is to say, God, I want to do things your way. Would you please give me your wisdom? And I think if James were sitting here with us, he would invite us to use these questions. Here's the challenge. Here's what I'd love for you to do this week. And set aside some time every day and think about these uh, questions and pray through them and pray about them. So um, uh, this one, number one, ask yourself, have I given myself the benefit of the doubt but refused it to my brother or sister or refused it for someone else? It's okay for me, but not for them. They've, they've got problems. They've got issues. Second, have I made excuses for my shortcomings but remained intolerant of others? And lastly, have I judged my brothers and sisters according to the letter of the law while expecting grace for myself? It's an easy thing to fall into. And as you're praying, God's voice is not one saying, how dare you? God's voice is one, if there's areas, if the answer is yes to those, I want you to, to perceive God's voice saying, son, daughter, you got out of step, but I can help you fix that. I can help you with the wisdom you need to, to get back in step with me. But guys, life is so precious. It is a vapor. We have a limited time to experience God's freedom. And the way the world is solving problems, the way our culture is solving problems, like that's, that's not gonna help us live this life well, not at all. And if we try to do this life on our own terms, we're setting ourselves up for a disaster. So let's all allow God, as if God needs us to allow anything, let's allow God to be in the place of God. Let's lay down Let's lay down all the ways we try to carry God's responsibilities. And let's take our proper place in being a part of what God is trying to do here. So let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, for those of us that are facing oh, challenges and barriers and obstacles and hurts, God, we ask right now that, um, that everyone in the sound of my voice will experience your presence, experience um, a hope, that you have supernaturally injecting hope into their situations. And we thank you for preserving the words of your servant, James. And we ask that you would guide us as we reflect on them this week and uh, reflect on all the ways that you are calling us to have our words and our beliefs and our life match up. We need your help to do it. So thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So would love to journey with you this week. So please don't be shy about reaching out. Of, uh, if you have a question about something we said or, or something else to add, I'd love to hear what, how you're processing these passages that we've been going through. Or if you have a prayer request, you can always find us at sgbic.com. If you scroll down, there's a box there where it'll generate a message to us and you can reach us 24 seven and we'll get back to you. So until we're together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and may you perceive the Lord being gracious to you. And may God give you his peace. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.